Many of you guys already know Millie Vanilli, but to give a refresher, they made hit songs in the 80s such as Girl You Know It's True, yes, you know it's true. Blame It On The Rain, and my favorite, Baby Don't Forget My Number. Their story is tragic, but there hasn't been someone who's given the full truth of the situation, and that's what I'm here to do today. There's so much to talk about, but first, let's start out with who they are. Rob Pilatus was born on June 8, 1965 in Munich, West Germany, to an African-American father and a German mother who was a fantastic dancer. And just like his mother, Rob's feet could move to any rhythm. However, Rob had a very rough childhood. First, his biological parents abandoned him in an orphanage before he turned one. He was then later adopted by a white German family at the age of four. Secondly, Rob was black, and being black in a country like Germany back then was not fun. Rob was called names like Kunta Kente, and he faced lots and lots of racial profiling from his classmates and almost everyone around him, but he had to learn to deal with it. When he became a teenager, he left his adopted family to find himself. He started off as a solo model and breakdancer in Munich. He soon discovered he had a passion for singing and became a backup singer with the group Wind at the 1987 Eurovision Song Contest in Brussels, which the band ended up getting second place in. He was doing pretty well for himself and at the same time was becoming very popular within Munich. However, that was the moment the second half of Millie Vanilli, Fab Morvan, came into the picture. And just like Rob, Fab was full of talent. Fab was born on May 14, 1966 in Paris, France. And unlike Rob, Fab Morvan was more reserved, like an introvert. He got connected to art in high school where he learned to dance and also discovered music to be a lifeline for him. Then, at the age of 18, he moved to Munich, Germany, where he also became a dancer and a model. At the time, there weren't many black people in the city, so it was easy for black people to connect with one another. After almost a year in Munich, Fab Morvan met Rob Pilatus. Now, at first, when these two met, they weren't friends at all. They had similar physiques, both looked good, and were both multi-talented, so it created some type of competition between them. But in Fab Morvan's words, if you can't beat them, join them. And that's exactly what he did. Rob and Fab then formed a musical group known as Empire Bazaar, with a third singer known as Charlene or Charlene. Ich heiße Robert Pilatus. Ich bin Charlene Persien. Je suis Fabrice Weiss. They formed this group in 1987 and released a song called Dances in 1988. But before this, Rob and Fab collaboratively worked as models to pay their bills. They modeled at fashion festivals, runway shows, and did photo shoots for brands. But even with all of the jobs, they were struggling financially, barely making ends meet and trying everything under the stars to make their big breakout in the music scene. At some point within the same time period, they began performing at a club in Munich. According to Fab, this club was pretty small for you to judge it from the outside, but when you got in, the place was stacked with high-profile German businessmen and some really popular people. A lot of American and European stars also performed there like Charlie Wilson, Bono, and the late Whitney Houston. However, since Empire Bazaar was an unpopular musical group, they were given only about 20 minutes to perform during events at the club. But with the few minutes they had, they caught the eyes of a very famous music producer named Frank Farian, the man behind everything. So to understand the story behind Millie Vanilli, you need to know the story of Frank and the previous music scandals he has pulled off. It looks very great, and I think maybe in the next time, we have an idea for you. Frank Farian was born on July 18, 1941. He is a German record producer, musician, singer, songwriter, and the man behind Millie Vanilli. Frank grew up in the 50s and was a fan of US and UK pop music. Frank worked as a cook, but a part of him always wanted to be in the music industry. Fast forward to a couple of years later, and Frank was one step closer to his dream. Frank soon got his first success in the music industry producing songs. One of those songs was released in April 1967, and it was a cover of Otis Ray Redding's Mr. Pitiful. Then, in 1976, Frank's German language cover for Dickie Lee's song, Rocky, remained number one on German music charts for about four weeks, receiving gold certification. But that's not even the best part. In 1976, Frank joined the disco trend and released the track Baby Do You Wanna Bump with a few other session singers. Baby Do You Wanna Bump was an instant hit in countries across Europe. And from this, you can tell Frank was a pretty successful solo artist. However, for some reason, he got very greedy. 
and this greed led him to create a group, but it wasn't just any group. He created a lip-syncing group called Boney M. Boney M is a German Caribbean disco and funk group that sold over 100 million records. But you see, without Boney M, Millie Vanilli would have never been a thing, and here's why. Boney M was a disco and funk musical group created by Frank somewhere between 1974 and 1976. He formed this group in Western Germany with its original four members, Liz Mitchell, Marcia Barrett, Maisie Williams, and Bobby Farrell. And if you wondered how he formed the group's name, well, he got the inspiration after watching the Australian television detective series, Boney. In an interview about this, Farian once said, and I quote, I turned on the TV one day and it was the end of a detective series. I just caught the credits and it said Boney. Nice name, I thought. Boney, 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 Boney M. Boney, Boney, Boney M. Nice sound. End quote. But what he didn't mention was that two years before he even created this musical group, he had already recorded the dance track, Baby Do You Wanna Bump, using his own vocals. Do you wanna bump? Do you, do you wanna bump? The song blew up in some parts of Europe and he needed people to perform during shows and make TV appearances. So he made the male dancer, Bobby Farrell, lip sync the lyrics of this track and other tracks done for the group. Now, Boney M was a test project for Frank. He used them as a front for his personal records and made millions off of them. Boney M released its first album, Take the Heat Off of Me, in 1976. The album had tracks recorded by Frank, Marcia Barrett, Liz Mitchell, and another of Frank's contracted vocals by the name of Jilla or Gelia. And in their second album, Love for Sale, released in 1977, the group had singles that reached number one in Germany and the top 10 UK charts. One of the songs on this album is Ma Baker, which was later sampled by Lady Gaga in her 2008 song, Poker Face. And in 1978, they dropped their best-selling album, Night Flight to Venus, which included insane hits like Rasputin and Rivers of Babylon. So the idea of the group was that Bobby Farrell, the lead vocalist, or should I say, the lead performer, would lip sync parts of the tracks originally sung by Frank, while the remaining female singers didn't lip sync. The original members of the group stayed together from 1976 to 1986, but along the line, Bobby Farrell had issues with Frank, and so he had quit. If you want a full video going over Boney M's story, let me know in the comments below. Now, at this point, I need you to understand that using people as a front for his music has always been Frank's thing, and Boney M was the beginning of the Farian madness but they were not the last. And when it came to Millie Vanilli, he took things to a whole new level, a level that even Frank himself couldn't control. Let's fast forward back to where we left off. After Rob and Fab met Frank at this Munich club, they got invited to his famous estate in the same area. He had about four studios with mixers and music equipment that was worth millions of dollars. He also had numerous gold records hanging on the walls from Boney M's success. Seeing all these, Rob and Fab were instantly thrown into a frenzy, like who wouldn't be carried away? Once they got into the studio, Frank played them a demo of Girl You Know It's True, and at the time, Rob and Fab had no idea that Girl You Know It's True was an existing song by the American music group Newmarks. And at the same time, Rob and Fab didn't notice that the vocals on the track were muted. Girl, you know it's, yes, you know it's true. According to Rob in an interview, he once said, and I quote, Frank asked us our opinion of it and if we could sing it. And we said, yeah, we could sing it. And he said, oh, beautiful. I believe it. But next week we have shows to do. So don't worry. I'll make you into a millionaire. And that was it. That was the moment Rob and Fab had changed their future forever. And you can't really blame them for what they did. They were young, broke hustlers who were looking to grasp any hope of fame or wealth in the music industry that was thrown their way. And Frank was offering it to them on a gold platter. With that, they signed a record deal with Frank without reading the terms of the contract, without having an attorney present, and without asking for more than a $1,500 advance that Frank was offering them. They signed under Frank's management to produce 10 tracks a year, but when they got into the studio to actually record songs, their vocals weren't good enough, according to Frank. But Rob and Fab had every other quality to make them a star. They had the looks, they had the dance moves, and they were entertainers. Those were all the qualities Frank needed to create Millie Vanilli. But how exactly did they become worldwide stars? Frank had ghostwriters and vocalists produce tracks for the group. 
However, he needed Rob and Fab to be the performers and to lip sync these tracks similar to Boney M. But in the beginning, Rob and Fab had no idea about this. And for like two or three months, he kept providing them with anything they wanted. More money for hair, for rent, anything. All in a bid, in my opinion, to trap them. Now in the middle of Rob and Fab enjoying Frank's allowances, Frank broke the news that he needed them to lip sync the track. Girl, you know it's true. Frank told Rob since they both spoke German and then Rob told Fab. They were both very angry about it and wanted out. But hey, they had signed the contract and they did so naively. The only way to get out of the contract was to pay Frank every penny he had advanced them in the last couple of months. And it wasn't a huge sum of money, let's say like $5,000, but you need to understand that these guys were young and broke, and in their minds, they thought they would never see a better opportunity of entering the music industry than the one that Frank was offering them. So after thinking about it, they agreed to it, at least to pay back Frank what they owed him. But little did they know that their lives were about to change forever. Girl You Know It's True was released and it went crazy. It launched Millie Vanilli to the front lines of success in the music industry. The song blew up in Munich and became one of the biggest songs in Europe and soon crossed over to the US. Rob and Fab got a taste of what fame felt like. And as much as they could have stopped the whole show at this point, they couldn't. Imagine you were in their shoes and your dream life started playing out. You have the money, the girls, the world loves you. Would you stop? I mean, I don't know about you, but I definitely wouldn't. But for Rob and Fab, all they could do was play along and hope that someday Frank would actually give them the chance to sing on a track. The next couple of singles released by Millie Vanilli had zero artistic input from either Rob or Fab. And by May 1988, they were touring France, Spain, and Italy, lip syncing all their songs while they were dancing it up all across the world. At this point, Rob and Fab began questioning Frank, asking him when they were actually going to sing on a track. But Frank blew them off each time. And by the summer of 1988, Frank wrote most of the material used in their debut album, All or Nothing, released in Europe in November of 1988. After Frank released the album, he came clean to Robin Fab, telling them it was too late to back out. And I bet the pain they felt in the moment must have been unimaginable. He also threw in a $20,000 paycheck to compensate. This moment was a big crossroad for them, but most importantly, it was the moment they realized their voices were never going to be heard on a Millie Vanilli track. On the bright side, the fame was good. They had parties every weekend and were living their best lives. And just when they thought it couldn't get any better, it actually did. Frank had signed Millie Vanilli to Arista Records, which brought their talents to the US. If there's one thing you need to know about Arista Records, it's the fact that these guys had some of the biggest artists in the music industry back in the 80s. I'm talking about big names like Whitney Houston and Aretha Franklin. This was prime Arista under the management of the man himself, Clive Davis. So while Millie Vanilli was riding the tides of success in Europe, Frank was negotiating a contract with the record label. His efforts eventually pulled through and Arista Records signed a recording deal with Frank's management, putting Millie Vanilli under the label. They then re-released their debut album on March 7th, 1989 under a new name to the audiences in the US. Again, it was a major success, having five songs claim the top five spots of the US Billboard Hot 100. By January 1990, the repackaged album was certified six times platinum by the RIAA after spending seven weeks on the Billboard Hot 200. The album sold 7 million copies in the US and 14 million worldwide. It was crazy. Arista Records was swimming in money. Frank Farian was cashing in paychecks while Rob and Fab, cashing in paychecks as well, were left to deal with the pressure all alone. However, with all eyes now on Millie Vanilli, the truth began to unravel. When their album blew up in the American market, Rob and Fab were exclusively credited as the lead vocalists. This made the original rapper on Girl You Know It's True, Charles Shaw, disclosed to New York Newsday's writer John Leyland that Rob and Fab were just frontmen for Frank. This pissed off a lot of people, especially Frank. But before we get into the details of what came next, let's first talk about who Charles Shaw really is. Born on July 4th, 1960, Charles Shaw is an American rapper and singer. Shaw was reportedly paid $6,000 to perform the rap on Millie Vanilli's hit single, Girl You Know It's True. However, after the song blew up in the United States and the vocals were explicitly attributed to Rob and Fab, Charles Shaw blew the whistle on what was really going on behind the scenes. Frank Farian, Arista, and Millie Vanilli were so mad at this move from Shaw. Frank even offered him $150,000 to attract his statement, which we don't know if he took, but regardless, Frank fired Shaw and used a different rapper for other tracks. Now to be clear, this really didn't have any impact on the group, but soon after, people began picking up on the fact that the voices heard in the songs were different from Rob and Fab's. The media and fans started questioning the duo's authenticity, leading to an intense scrutiny and widespread speculation about their musical abilities. All it took was one public mistake to ruin everything. That day never came, but it almost did in 1989 in Bristol, Connecticut. 
During their 1989 live performance on Club MTV at the Lake Compounds theme park in Bristol, Connecticut, they were performing Girl You Know It's True when tragedy struck. A hard drive issue caused the track Girl You Know It's True to loop the part Girl You Know It's through the speakers. And this incident just made it obvious that they weren't actually giving a live performance. It was Rob's part, so he got so furious and left the stage immediately. Speaking on the incident, he did say, and I quote, I knew right then and there, it was the beginning of the end for Millie Vanilli. When my voice got stuck in the computer and it just kept repeating and repeating, I panicked. I didn't know what to do. I just ran off the stage, end quote. But for some reason, the audience didn't seem to care at all. Everyone just kind of waved it away. Because remember, this is the late 80s, early 90s, and lots of artists would lip sync. However, Rob's guts were right. It was the beginning of the end for Millie Vanilli. And at this point, rumors began spreading about the voice mismatch. In fact, it got so bad that a few TV shows like Living in Color, hosted by Keenan and Damon, parodied their accents in a skit. No, you can't be Vanilli. I am always Vanilli. No, but you can't be Vanilli too best dread. Making more people aware that something fishy was going on. Even Fab revealed that once he saw those skits, he knew deep down that the end was near, and it truly was. From that point, their hype continued to still go up and up, and after a few months, they won three categories at the American Music Awards, and a month later, on February 21st, 1990, the Grammys came. It was unbelievable. And this was truly a kiss of death for Millie Vanilli. Earlier that night, the group performed, but remember, they were lip-syncing. So how'd they do it? Because Grammy performances are meant to be live, right? Well, according to longtime Grammy producer Ken Ehrlich, or Ehrlich, it was one of the rare times in his own 40-year career that a musical act would be allowed to lip-sync on the show. Another artist that was allowed to do this was Janet Jackson a few years before. So it was just seen as a way of honoring craft and artistry, but not for Millie Vanilli. After their amazing performance, they were seated front row with their hearts pounding fast. Later on that night, they were nominated alongside Indigo Girls, Nene Cherry, Soul to Soul, and Tone Loke for Best New Artist. As they nervously waited, the host, Chris Christopherson, and Young MC announced. And the Best New Artist is... Millie Vanilli. They never expected it. And in that moment, it just felt wrong. In Rob's acceptance speech, he dedicated the award to every artist around the world. There are a lot of artists here in this room. There are a lot of artists outside in the world who can achieve the same award that we achieved today. And it's an award for all artists in the world. Thank you very much. He did this in the spur of the moment, but it just went on to show how much they felt that they really didn't deserve such a prestigious award. That's one of the biggest categories in the Grammys, and winning it was both a blessing and a curse. If you're wondering why, then just hold on because we're about to find out. There are a lot of artists here in this room. There are a lot of artists outside in the world who can achieve the same award that we achieved today. After plastering their names across the record books as one of the biggest musical groups in history with their Grammy win, Millie Vanilli went on over a hundred tours in eight months. They were living life on the fast lane, and the only way to keep up with the momentum was with lots of drinking and drugs. On the other hand, Frank was trying to get them to lip sync another album, you know, to keep the money coming in. But Rob and Fab were not interested anymore and they wanted out. This obviously made Frank very mad because his so-called music projects began getting a mind of their own. Rob and Fab asked for more money, wanted to move out of Europe and into the United States where Frank wouldn't have as much control as he always did. And they wanted to make a transition with their sound where they were actually singing on their own tracks. They even went as far as getting lawyers this time, demanding that Frank lets them sing. But Frank didn't take these requests so lightly. So with his bitter pride and ego, he jumped the gun. And that was it. On November 14th, 1990, the final blow came. Frank Farian came out and announced that Rob Pilatus and Fab Morvan were lip syncing on all of the album and their hit singles. Almost immediately, Los Angeles Times confronted Rob on the accusation and he released a statement saying, and I quote, It's true, Millie Vanilli didn't sing. I feel like a mosquito being squeezed. The last two years of our lives have been a total nightmare. We've had to lie to everybody. We are true singers, but that maniac Frank Farian would never allow us to express ourselves. And then on November 20th, 1990, 
Robin Fab did an interview with over a hundred journalists in LA, where they stated their willingness to return the Grammy, also singing and rapping for the journalists to know they were actual singers. To sing on the record, he promised us, he gave us the word, and you see what he did now, he turned around, he speed because for money. This conference was very pivotal in their story as it happened just days after Frank blew their cover, and it also gave the world a first-hand insight into what they were actually going through. They then gave a complete breakdown on how Frank approached them and extended his devious offer. Oh, and contrary to what was said in the news, Arista Records had Clive Davis knew. Mr. Clive Davis knew. He promised us to help to persuade Frank to sing on the record. He promised us. He gave us the word. When asked how they felt about doing the lip sync, Rob Plata said, it was like making a pact with the devil. They always felt alone and guilty when all the lights and cameras went off. They were also asked, why didn't they stop the charade a lot sooner? And then Rob insisted that they were the ones who stopped it, not Frank. And that's actually true to some extent because if they never had made all of those demands, Frank wouldn't have blown their cover. The journalists, still not convinced, asked them to sing Girl You Know It's True mid-interview, which they did. To be fair, it sounded a little bit off, but it wasn't that bad at all. Oh, and when asked about their Grammy performance, Rob said that they knew they had to lip sync correctly in front of a half of a billion people. With the rumors already making news headlines, it just added more pressure on them. And then finally, the big question came. One interviewer said what I think must have been on your mind at some point in this video. He said he felt it was wrong that the only justification they could give for the entire scandal was that Frank blackmailed them with money. But in reality, their own greed and hunger for fame played a part in it. Rob replied to the journalist by saying, if he didn't take the deal, he probably would have still been in Munich, living in the projects and working at McDonald's. So he did what anyone would have done in that situation. And that was how the conference ended. Now at this point, the big question became, if Rob and Fab weren't the real voices behind their hit album in the song Girl You Know It's True, then who were the original singers? With the truth out, Millie Vanilli gave back their Grammy Awards as was demanded, even though they actually wanted to hand it back in the first place. See, the rules for the Grammy Awards says that the artists are ineligible for a Grammy if they have zero artistic input in the song. And who knows, maybe that was the same rule back then. But in the middle of all the drama came an avalanche of lawsuits. About 26 class action lawsuits were filed against the music group and Arista Records. Clive Davis, the head of the label, immediately released Rob and Fab from their contract and offered compensation to everyone who had purchased copies of Millie Vanilli's albums or single as ordered by a court in the US. Whether Arista Records did this or did not, we don't know, but we do know that there were lots of lawsuits. Robin Fab almost ended up in jail. One of the biggest lawsuits filed against them came from singer-songwriter David Clayton Thomas, who sued Millie Vanilli for copyright infringement on the song All or Nothing. Clayton Thomas' lawsuit claimed that the melody used in this song was similar from his 1968 composition, Spinning Wheel, with his group Blood, Sweat, and Tears. What goes up must come down. Spinning wheel. Rob and Fab were forced to pay huge sums to their attorneys just to make sure that the lawsuits went away. And after some time, Frank started getting his own share of the backlash from creating Millie Vanilli. But to defend himself, Frank went on different media rounds claiming Millie Vanilli never wanted to sing or do anything but party. These claims had a very, very negative effect on Rob and Fab, especially Rob. His drug addiction was getting worse by the months. They were in and out of rehab a couple of times, but Rob's addictions were getting worse. Fab, on the other hand, tried his best to stay away. But just when everyone thought things couldn't get any worse, Frank Farion created yet another musical group called The Real Millie Vanilli. Keep on And if that sounds crazy to you, well, that's because it is. But the question everyone's asking is, who the heck was the real Millie Vanilli? Like, who were the original members? Frank was the kind of man that was always driven by money. So he found a way to profit from the whole scandal. He created a new group called The Real Millie Vanilli. The music group was made with the real vocalists behind Millie Vanilli, as we know as Brad Howell, John Davis, and they added a new person to the group, rapper Icy Bro, and they added two new members, Ray Horton and Gina Muhammad, as well as a couple of other guest singers. 
the group released only one album called The Moment of Truth, which was meant to be Millie Vanilli's second album. But since Rob and Fab were out of contract, Frank redesigned the album cover, credited the tracks to the original singers, or the real singers, and released the album only in some specific European and Asian countries. Well, they actually did release in the US, but it was not under the name The Real Millie Vanilli, it was under the name Try and Be. However, to be honest, The Real Millie Vanilli didn't have as much success as Frank probably thought in his head. And after a few more singles, they vanished from the spotlight. Frank had made his money, and Arista Records had made their money. But it was time for Rob and Fab to show the world that they were actually very talented individuals. So they created a group called Rob and Fab. But how did that work out? In 1991, they signed with Joss Entertainment Group and had a new manager, Sandy Gollin. They recorded an album with Taj Records in 1992 titled Rob and Fab, but it didn't have as much success. For one, the record label didn't have much money to put out copies of the album. When I say not much money, they literally did not have money to put their album in stores. And two, Rob Pilatus was head deep in drugs. He barely even featured on the album. Here, take a look for yourself. And it was disappointing. No longer known as Millie Vanilli, the two who now go by Rob and Fab are come out with a new album, hoping the public will forgive and forget their embarrassing past. This new album only sold about 2,000 copies, and it wasn't because people didn't want to listen to Rob and Fab anymore, but because there weren't any copies available in stores. The album was only released in the United States, which at the time was the priority market for them. However, cancel culture hit them before its time. They fell off pop culture, but most importantly, Rob was losing his mind. Rob was becoming a shadow of himself. He was losing his mind to drugs and alcohol as the days went by. But out of nowhere, Frank tried to come back into his life. Since no record label was even willing to sign them to a contract, Frank decided to produce a new album for Rob and Fab, but this time, they'd be the lead vocals. Some of Frank's contract singers even backed the duo on some of the tracks on the album. It was kind of like their last shot at a comeback. Rob was dead broke at the time, so he was willing to take Frank's deal, but not Fab. Rob was too messed up to do anything. He tried committing suicide a couple of times, including one time he tried jumping from a nine-story building. It was at this hotel in Los Angeles early Saturday morning that police found him ready to take his life. And then in 1996, Rob served three months in prison for assault, vandalism, and attempted robbery. Frank got him out of prison and cleared all charges against him. Frank also signed Rob up for six months of rehab, but nothing worked. But then, on April 3rd, 1998, Rob Pilatus died of an alcohol and drug overdose at a hotel in Frankfurt, Germany. However, just like the death of almost every celebrity, a few things don't sit right with Rob's death as well. Some say it was suicide because Frank allegedly paid Rob to get into rehab somewhere in India. The plan was for him to be 100% sober, but he died the night before his departure. So it doesn't really make sense. Or it could also be that he went overboard that night since he knew he'd be headed to India the next day to sober up. It's really just one of those things we'll never know. But the saddest part is, he died two months before his 33rd birthday. So, what happened to Fab? After Rob's death, Fab began performing as a DJ at LA's famous radio station, KISS FM. A year later, he got a good gig to perform at the station's sold-out 1999 Wango Tango concert in front of 50,000 people. Then, in 2003, he dropped his first solo album, Love Revolution, recording, producing, writing, and singing on all of the tracks. We don't know how well this album performed, but what we do know is that he took an extremely long time off of the music scene, just performing at a few small concerts and clubs. So we'll never know if Millie Vanilli would have been successful with their own voices. You know, maybe they could have still been popular today if Frank never exposed them. But at the end of the day, we can't help but wonder, could Millie Vanilli's lip syncing scandal be just the tip of the iceberg? What other celebrities are secretly lying about their true identity? Sources tell us Millie Vanilli are not the only imposters in town. And Millie Vanilli are not the only imposters in town. <laughs>